Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. Solid state storage is pretty much standard in 2022 when this is being filmed. In 2016, when we started our YouTube channel, it most definitely was not. Most laptops and most pre-builts in 2016 did not come with SSDs and many, many people still built even custom computers without a solid state boot drive. Today, Many of you may have an all SSD machine with zero spinning rust drives inside of your machine, and that's just a trend that's going to continue. Today, I want to take you down the history of SSDs that we've looked at throughout the history of our channel over the past six years from 2016 to today. We are not going to look at every one of these. First of all, there are many duplicates here, but what you are looking at here is a majority of the SSDs that we have either used or tested or installed in some form or fashion in one of the builds, one of the upgrades, one of the videos, or one of the SSD roundups that we've done on our channel in the past six years. We will show some of the details on them, but this is not meant to be a in-depth review of everything for SSDs for all time, because then we'd be here for 10 hours. And in my experience, none of you like to watch 10 hour videos, so we're definitely not going to do that. Your thoughts, your comments, and your suggestions on a similar style roundup video on other topics, RAM, graphics cards, CPUs, motherboards, leave those in the comment section below. I'd like to know what you think. Today's video is brought to you by Ewin Racing, the best source for gaming chairs and desks for those long gaming sessions. We have a playlist of our Ewin chair and desk videos linked in the video description below. Save 30% off of everything using the discount code TECHDEALS. More details at the end of the video. Starting off with one of the best SSDs of the past couple of years, this is in no chronological order, mind you, is the Samsung 980 Pro. This is what is called an NVMe, Non-Volatile Memory Express. It's actually a standard. And these generally come on M.2 sticks that you put onto a slot on your motherboard. Common misconception, NVMe and the M.2 stick format have nothing to do with each other whatsoever. One is a standard or protocol for the actual SSD itself, and the other is an interface port. The M.2 slot on your motherboard is actually a four-lane PCI Express slot in just a slightly different shape and configuration, which is why $7 adapters exist to put M.2 drives onto existing drop-in slots because it's simply running the wires to the PCI Express slot. That's neither here nor there, but that's what that is. You can also get NVMe drives in what's called U2 configuration. They look just like SATA drives. They have a cable that plugs into the motherboard, cable that plugs into the drive, it's just that it uses a data cable, but it is PCI Express and it is NVMe, just like an M.2 drive. Don't worry, I won't repeat that for every one of them, but for those of you who didn't know, that's what it is. The Samsung 980 Pro is a Gen 4, PCI Express Gen 4 premium NVMe drive. This is a TLC or tri-level cell, meaning there's three bits stored for every uh, actual data cell, every NAND cell on the drive. There's SLC, which is 1-bit, MLC, which is 2-bit, TLC, which is 3-bit, and QLC, which is 4-bit. And there is a 5-bit cell coming out, but those are going to be horribly slow and really used for archive usage, most likely. So this is a TLC drive, and it's currently one of the fastest NVMe drives, at least from a consumer point of view, that you can buy. The Samsung 990 Pro, that's a terrible name, 980 990. The 990 Pro has launched for about 50% more money than this drive. It is faster, but it's still a Gen 4 drive. It is not a Gen 5 drive. And in my opinion, it is not worth the price premium. When the price comes down, then it'll be worth it. These things are wonderful. It is fast. It is responsive. It has an excellent processor and controller on board. It has tremendous write life. The two terabyte version of this has 1200 terabytes of drive write life. Not all two terabyte SSDs have a 1.2 petabyte write life. Add to that an excellent warranty and the fact that these have come way down in price from when it launched back in 2020. You can now buy a two terabyte Samsung 980 Pro premium drive for $200. That is pretty sweet. 
If you're building a new premium machine today, this should be on your short list for boot drives. Continuing on with Samsung, the 970 EVO Plus released just before the 980 Pro in 2019. It is a refresh version of the 970 EVO, which released in 2018. There's a theme going on there if you want to follow it. This is a premium NVMe SSD, but it is a Gen 3 drive instead of a Gen 4 drive. Gen 3 simply means that 4 gigabytes per second is the absolute maximum theoretical transfer rate, whereas Gen 4 with four lanes means that 8 gigabytes per second is the maximum theoretical transfer rate. The reality is they're never quite that fast. This is about 3.5 gigabytes per second. The 980 Pro is about 7 gigabytes per second. Those are sequential numbers, and that's important, because in random reads and random writes, they're both pretty close. Both of the drives are very close in many other features as well. They're, both of the drives I'm showing you are the two terabyte size. This has a two gigabyte DRAM buffer. Same thing with the 980 Pro. It is worth noting that not all drives have the same size DRAM buffer. Having a DRAM buffer is nice. Having a large DRAM buffer is better. If you want to save about $50 or about 25%, even on new builds, there's nothing wrong with going with a 970 EVO Plus. If you're putting a drive into an older machine that doesn't have Gen 4 support, might as well save the money and get one of these. Next up in Samsung's line is an interesting drive, the 860 EVO. Now the Samsung 860 EVO is a SATA or serial ATA drive, regardless of what the form factor it comes in looks like. And this goes along with what I said regarding the fact that NVMe does not have to be an M.2. There are 2.5 inch NVMe drives using the U.2 interface. In this case, you can see a pair of 860 EVOs. This is a 2.5 inch drive that connects via standard SATA cable. This is an M.2 drive that plugs into an M.2 slot on your motherboard, but it is still SATA. It is not NVMe. And it does require an M.2 slot on a motherboard that supports SATA connections. Not all do. The actual interface connection is different and it runs through the uh, chipset typically using one of the SATA ports rather than directly to the CPU or using the PCI Express lanes. It's kind of an interesting wiring configuration they have to put on the motherboard. There is zero performance difference between these drives. It really is just a SATA drive using a different plug. More convenient, but these are kind of going out of favor at this point because NVMe's gotten cheaper and drives are getting bigger and it really is kind of unnecessary today. But in 2018, when these were released, it definitely was a thing. Now the four terabyte size that you see here is only available in the two and a half inch size. The two terabyte size uh, was the largest you could get an M.2 drive, even though this is not. And they also offered it in M SATA, which is not a format I want to spend a lot of time talking about because nobody uses it anymore and hardly anybody used it to begin with. But there was a different onboard SATA connection that was not M.2 and not a standard SATA connector called M SATA, and those maxed out at one terabyte of storage. Now, the interesting thing about the 860 EVO is it follows the same DRAM buffer pattern as its NVMe counterparts. One gigabyte of DRAM is included to act as a buffer on the one terabyte size, two gigabytes on the two terabyte size, and this four terabyte drive, you guessed it, has four gigabytes of DRAM buffer. Now, being limited to SATA, they have a maximum theoretical speed of about 600 megabytes per second, real world about 550. But that is sequential, not random. Their random performance is shockingly not that far off of their NVMe counterparts. NAND is NAND. It doesn't care whether it's in a SATA drive or an NVMe drive. If you use premium NAND, which Samsung does because they make their own NAND. In fact, Samsung is one of the few manufacturers that makes the entire thing. They make the actual NAND memory chips. They make the controller. It's a Samsung controller. They make the DRAM because Samsung's one of only three companies in the world that makes DRAM. Micron, SK Hynix, and Samsung are the only three companies in the world that make DRAM. So everything on these drives is made by Samsung. That's pretty cool. If you don't have any free M.2 slots and you need to add an SSD, it is really hard to go wrong with an 860 EVO. Next up, we have a very close cousin to the 860 EVO, the 860 QVO. This is a one terabyte Samsung 860 QVO 
This is a one terabyte Samsung 860 Evo. The only real difference between these drives, TLC, QLC. I mentioned on the first drive, we were talking about what each drive is. The 860 Evo has three bits per cell. The 860 Qvo has four bits per cell. So there are physically fewer NAND chips on this drive. There are a couple of consequences to that. Write performance is absolutely trash when you overrun the SLC cache. Now, all of these drives have SLC caches. You have to go back quite a ways before you don't, really MLC drives, uh, before you get to drives that don't have SLC caches. TLC drives generally have to have one because the, the raw TLC write performance is not what you would be happy with in a modern drive. When you're writing to the SLC cache on either one of these drives, performance is great, fantastic, no problem. But if the SLC cache fills up, if you're doing major game updates, if you're copying over a lot of files, if you're doing a lot of reading and writing, if Fortnite's updating, if World of Warships is updating, those games actually run patches rather than just download new files. Some games just download new files and they're easy peasy, no big deal. But games that sit there and patch and modify and write, oh boy, you can be in for a very long afternoon the minute you overrun your buffer. Now, the SLC cache gets larger on larger drives. Get a four or eight, 8 terabyte version. Actually, I think the 8 terabytes are only in the eight in the uh, 870 Cubo. We'll get to that in a minute. But the larger the drive, then the larger the SLC cache, and it makes it pretty nice. This is one of the few really nice QLC SSDs that has a full DRAM buffer. One gigabyte of DDR4 for each terabyte of storage. So the four terabyte version of this just like the four terabyte version of the 860 Evo, four gigabytes of DRAM. Now, many of you are gonna ask, what is a DRAM buffer? I've mentioned the term DRAM buffer several times. A DRAM buffer is not a read-write cache. That's what the SLC is for. And of course, Windows offers a certain amount of read-write caching built into it. The DRAM buffer keeps track of where everything is on the SSD. The DRAM buffer essentially is the lookup table for where to put everything. If you don't have a DRAM buffer on an SSD, there are effectively two ways to handle this. One, you can use a portion of the SSD storage in SLC mode, which runs the risk of doing a lot of write amplification and burning it out over time, but you can, because it doesn't cost the manufacturer or anything. It's a cheap way to go. And the other way is to use host memory. So if you've got a one terabyte SSD, it can use a portion of a couple hundred megabytes on a larger SSD, it might use up to a gigabyte of your main system RAM to act as that host memory buffer. If I'm not careful, this is gonna sound like a Samsung review. Maybe it should have been, regardless. Samsung 960 Evo. Shortest coverage ever. A slightly slower 970 Evo. Released in 2016, not quite as fast. This generation, its read speed did not hit 3.5 gigabytes per second. It wasn't quite good enough at that time. It was about 3.2, 3.3. And the sequential write speed was substantially slower than what later came out with the 970 Evo, 970 Evo Plus, et cetera, which could all do about three gigabytes per second. This was half that. You're looking at somewhere in the 1800 megabyte per second range, 1.8 gigabytes per second, which is still really good. And for 2016, that's not bad, but it definitely is a step back from the later drives. Now you'll notice that I've got it next to a 970 Evo Plus. There's nothing wrong with using a 960 Evo today. Absolutely nothing. If you have an extra 960 lying around and you're using it as a drive in an older machine, if you're using it as a secondary drive, you just want to drop it into maybe a media PC or one of your kids' PCs. It is a great drive today. There's no reason to get rid of one. I would still use it today. If I still had that, I don't think I actually do anymore. I think it got sold with one of the computers years ago, but absolutely good drive today. That brings us to an interesting drive, the Samsung 960 Pro. The 960 Pro is an MLC drive, and it's the first MLC drive that I have shown you so far. There is no SLC cache on this drive. It reads and writes to the entire drive directly. If you were to write a 50 gigabyte file to the 960 Evo, it first writes it to the SLC cache, 
And then while the drive is idle, it then moves that data internally in the background. You don't see it, Windows doesn't see it, the controller does it. The controller moves that data from the SLC cache to the TLC. There is no SLC cache on the 960 Pro because it directly writes to the full, full drive. Now this means that you get the full drive speed all the way through. This means there's no buffers to overrun. This means it's extremely consistent in performance. But when these came out, they cost a bloody fortune. Fun fact, the 960 Pro is slower than the 960 Evo, at least in terms of raw performance to the SLC cache versus the raw NAND. If you overrun the SLC cache, the performance of the 960 EVO falls apart completely. Let me give you a couple of interesting numbers. The 960 Pro is 1.5 gigabytes per second sequential write speed. That is 300 megabytes per second slower than the 960 EVO, which can do 1.8 gigabytes per second sequential write speed. And the 960 Pro cost way more money. However, the 500 gigabyte 960 Evo that I have here, which was a typical size for the time, terabyte drives were really expensive back then. This only has a 22 gigabyte SLC buffer. If you overrun that 22 gig buffer, this drops down to 600 megabytes per second sequential write speed. So if you do a full drive write, the first 22 gigs is at 1800, and then it drops down to 600. Whereas the 960 Pro, We'll do all 512, it's actually larger because it doesn't need the cache, all 512 gigabytes at 1.5 gigabytes per second. That's pretty cool. Modern drives are better than these were. I mean, the tech moved on, which is why the 980 Pro is a TLC drive with an SLC cache. They no longer do MLC drives. They do in enterprise applications and specialty applications, but typically consumer drives aren't available in MLC anymore. These were expensive back in 2016. And these were some of the very first drives that I bought for review and use and builds on the channel. The 960 Pro was a very, very nice drive, but in retrospect, the money would have been better spent on a one terabyte 960 Evo rather than a 512 gig 960 Pro. But if I don't use it, then how can I talk about it? How can I explain the experiences? Very fast drives for the time. One more interesting stat for you on these drives, which I think is interesting because this is the beginning of the channel. 400 terabytes of drive write life on the 512 gig size on the Pro, 200 on the 500 gig Evo. So half the drive write life rating and five-year warranty, three-year warranty. Not that it makes any difference whatsoever because these drives will still work fine today. I mean, honestly, the number of Samsung drives that have had a problem have I ever had a Samsung drive that's had a problem? I have not, knock on wood. Our last Samsung drive, for the moment, that there's one or two more in there, some older ones, is the 970 Pro, a refresh of the 960 Pro. Not really remarkable, few minor changes. One of the most interesting differences, it's, this is by the way, MLC as well. It didn't, it was the 980 Pro when they went to TLC. This is the last MLC consumer level drive they made. So this, is 600 terabytes of drive write life versus 400, both 500 gig sizes. So they increased the warranty on the drive write life by 50%. Probably just better NAND and they realized, hey, these things are lasting a lot longer than expected so we can offer a better warranty. But it came out a year or so later and it's just a refresh drive. Last but certainly not least is the Samsung 950 Pro. This was the first NVMe drive I ever used, ever bought, and this was in the $4,000 Ultimate build from 2016 on our channel. I actually bought this just before the 960s launched. That's life and how things work, but it's pretty cool. 512 gigs, which was the largest size you could buy one in at the time. There was never a one terabyte version of this drive. Similar overall specs to the 960 Pro MLC, there's no SLC cache, direct write, 400 terabytes drive write life rating, five year warranty, 1.5 gigabytes per second sequential write speed, 2.5 gigabytes per second sequential read speed. I said 2.5, 
not 3.5. It was substantially slower than the Gen 3 PCI Express bus it was plugged into. This is the early days. This drive was actually released in 2015, just before we started our YouTube channel. I was putting together what we needed to do. It was the current available drive. This cost a pretty penny back then. How much? Well, this is a trip down memory lane. I just looked up my order on Amazon. March 9th, 2016, I paid $327 for a 512 gigabyte Samsung 950 Pro. Wow, that money will buy a four terabyte drive today that is about three times faster than this. Isn't technology awesome? Finally, we are moving on from Samsung and going next door to Intel. Some of you may notice this pile of drives here. I have shown this on the channel before. I absolutely love these drives. Or I did. They're, they're kind of obsolete now in terms of new purchases. You shouldn't buy one of these today. But if you have one, you can absolutely use it. And I do. I still have multiple machines that have these drives installed. And they are excellent secondary and tertiary drives for machines. The Intel 660P was the first widely available QLC consumer SSD. Launching many years ago, way back in 2018, with capacities ranging from 512 gigabytes all the way up to two terabytes. Two terabytes in 2018 was impressive. Even more impressive, was the price. I bought multiple of these, two terabytes, two terabytes, two terabytes, two. How many of these do I have? Two, 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 two. two. I have an addiction. Stop it, get some help. Are these all two? Nope, that's one, that's one. Why do I have a 512 gig version? That's stupid. Two and two. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. That is 13 two terabyte QLC Gen 3 NVMe drives. That is 26 terabytes of storage. Well, it would be if they were all in there. These boxes are all empty now. Some of these are gone. I sold them. Some of them went with computers. I sold some of them. I still have. I've got the these sort of ended up as the secondary drives in a lot of computers. I think two of my kids' computers have one of these each in them for games. They're spread around the office into various. I've got one or two laptops that have one of these. Actually, what's interesting, I have two one terabyte drives. I can actually tell you where one of these is. One of the one terabyte versions of the 660p is currently sitting in my i7. 4790K computer. Yes, using a Z97 motherboard in 2014, you could get an M.2 slot way back then on DDR3 motherboards. Haswell of all things, Haswell refresh. My Z60, my Z87, I can't speak today. My Z87 does not have an M.2 slot, but my Z97 does. It's an Asus Z97-A, I believe. I'd have to go look it up, which I'm not going to do. Now, what's interesting is the M.2 slots back then were limited in performance. And I, I don't know if it was a chipset thing or whatnot, but modern Gen 3 can do 32 gigabits per second, which works out to four gigabytes per second, bits, bytes, divide by eight. But the M.2 slot in that machine can only do 10 gigabits per second, which is 1.25 gigabytes per second hardly matters on a 2014 i7 four core chip with a QLC drive, but there it is. Now, I just gave big long speeches about the benefits of DRAM buffers earlier in this video. These have DRAM buffers, tiny ones, 256 megabytes, regardless of the size. The two terabyte QLC 660p has a lousy 256 megabyte DRAM buffer. It's better than none. These drives are really good until you overload them. But the minute you overload them, they go to 
They're unpleasant in a big, big hurry. I've used them for all kinds of things. I actually had four of these in a RAID 0 array to give me an eight terabyte scratch drive for video editing. They were on an ASUS M.2 hypercard and inserted into my, well, at one point Threadripper build and then eventually the i9-10980XE high-end desktop CPU, which is on an X299 motherboard. More PCI Express lanes, you can put it in the third uh, PCI Express slot, which is a full 16 lanes. You go into the motherboard's BIOS and you turn on PC bifurcation. You split it up into four virtual PCI Express lanes in the BIOS, and then all of the drives are directly accessible by Windows. You go into the Windows software to disk management, you select the four drives, you create a Stripe drive array, and you get a single eight terabyte drive spread across. The benefit to doing so is you get four times the SLC cache because if you overrun the SLC cache and write, these things are awful. Speaking of SLC caches, we actually have some data on these that's harder to come by on a lot of other drives. When these two ter now the sizes change per drive, but when the two terabyte drive is empty, 280 gigabytes of SLC cache is available. Honestly, that's enough for most people. That really is, which makes these drives really, really nice because of that large cache. As the drive fills up, the SLC cache shrinks because it's actually using the TLC NAND as SLC cache. You can write TLC, Q I said TLC, QLC. The QLC NAND can be used as SLC. NAND is NAND. It can be written as SLC, MLC, TLC, QLC, so long as it's capable of each of those things and the controller can do it. So what the controller does is it dynamically reassigns some of the QLC on the drive in order to be SLC cache. But as the drive fills up, less and less gets used. 280 gigabytes when the drive is empty. When the drive is 80% full, there's only 24 gigabytes of SLC cache available from 80% to full. It's not hard to have a couple of game updates run and overrun that. You have not experienced bad performance if you have not run one of these out of SLC cache because it goes into the doghouse in a big, big hurry. And that is why the smaller sizes were always kind of very questionable. The 512 gig drive has a six gigabyte SLC cache when the drive is 80%. Six, six, not 60, six, six gigs. And 80% of a 500 gig drive is not hard to reach. Tons of 660Ps at the 512 and the one terabyte size were sold in laptops. They were sold in cheap pre-built desktops. And it's fine so long as you don't run into that. My wife's gaming PC at home, which was a ABS, well, technically it still is, although we've made some changes to it. It was an ABS pre-built from Newegg. i9-10850K, 10 cores, 20 threads, awesome. It came with 16 gigs of RAM, which is a joke for that kind of CPU. We fixed that. She's got 96 gigs of RAM now because we can. And it came from Newegg with an RTX 3090. That's pretty sweet. And a one terabyte 660p boot drive. It's NVMe. It's a terabyte. It looks good on the product pages. But an i9-10850K and an RTX 3090 and a QLC boot drive? Come on, you've got it. But that is so common. But the problem is while it's great when it's basically not full, 140 gigabytes of SLC cache, when that drive is 80% full, she's got 12 gigs, 12 of SLC cache. This is outrageous. It's unfair. You can't even run a World of Warships game update. Windows updates, you, you do a major window, you know, the annual Windows release, that can fill 12 gigs because of patches. It's not just downloading new files. A lot of games, World of Warships is a good example, they download the patch files and then they go through the entire game and update the code as required rather than downloading all new files. For people on limited bandwidth, it makes a lot of sense. For people with excellent bandwidth, it makes no sense at all. We have excellent internet connection. At home, we have a one gig connection. At the office, we have a five gig connection. I just rather we download the whole game, but they don't offer that option. So it is what it is. 
The sequential read and write is also limited. 1.8 gigabytes per second, read and write. If you're in the SLC cache on the right, read speed's the same either way, that's sequential. Write speed, take a guess as to what the sequential write speed is on one of these when you overwrite the cache. 100 megabytes per second. It's not horrible, but I have micro SD cards that will write faster than that. So there's that. These drives were not cheap in 2018, but they were not that expensive and they were way, way cheaper than TLC drives and whatnot. If you'd bought a Samsung 970 Evo back in 2018 at the two terabyte size, man, those would have been expensive. So that's why these existed. Great drives for the time, but in 2022, no, don't bother. Moving on from Intel, we have ADATA and the cutest little box that could. This is a fun drive for the history of our channel. Not probably all that important to most people, but it means something to me. This was the drive that was the boot drive in our very first Ryzen build, the Ryzen 7 1700 that we did back in March of 2017 when Ryzen launched. Ryzen was the first CPU and the first major product sent to us by a major company. I felt like we arrived. I'm like, wow, AMD wants to send us this. That was pretty cool. Well, they wanted to not go bankrupt. And so it turns out they sent Ryzen to basically everybody, at least the first two generations. Then they got pickier as they went along. So the Ryzen 7 1700 had this. It went into an Asus X... You know, speaking of which, I've had many people say to me that I pronounce that wrong. Asus, 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 Asus. 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 You know, at least Gigabyte is easy to say. MSI is easy to say. ASRock is easy to say. Asus. Asus. Asus is probably wrong. Whatever. That went into a Crosshair Hero 6 motherboard, only one M.2 slot, and that was fancy. I mean, back then, a single M.2 slot was normal. Perish the thought today. 256 gigabytes. That was normal for a boot drive back then. Holy smokes. All the other SSDs were SATA SSDs. And then hard drives, because of course you still had to have a hard drive. It couldn't go all SSD back in 2016. That'd be crazy insane. Today, it's completely normal. How much has changed in the past six years? The performance of this drive. Now, I said before that MLC drives didn't require SLC cache. The TLC drives do. This is an interesting hybrid. According to ADATA's review stuff, this is MLC. This is two bits per cell. This is not TLC but it does have an SLC cache and it does have a DRAM buffer, but it does not say how large. Why does it have an SLC cache when it's MLC? To make it faster? Hardly. The write speed on this? 600 megabytes per second. My disappointment is immeasurable and my day is ruined. Yeah. That's SATA level performance from an NVMe drive with a DRAM buffer and SLC cache. Go figure. At least its drive write life rating was pretty good. 160 gigabyte drive write life rating, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for 256 gig drive, that's actually pretty good. You would double that for 512 to 320, which for 2016 wouldn't have been bad. And then actually this was available in a one terabyte version. And that one had a one gigabyte per second sequential write speed, which I guess for 2016 wasn't too bad. I have absolutely no idea what this cost because ADATA sent me this drive, which we included. Back then, ADATA sent us an absolute ton of stuff. They sent us several of these drives that we're going to talk about. They haven't sent me anything for years. It's just fine. Um, the last drive they sent me, I think, was an SX8200 Pro, which we'll get to in a minute. And that's an interesting topic as well. 
because there's like three or four versions of the 8200 Pro with different controllers and different man because they started playing the game of changing the hardware after it got sent to reviewers and no, it didn't get faster. Hey Data, shame on you for that. In any case, this is the cute little SSD that could. I still have this drive. It's sitting on a shelf. I will probably never use it again. Even in my old machines, I would use at least a one terabyte drive. So I keep it mostly for nostalgia purposes because it's not like it has any economic value at this point. Next up, we have the cute little SSD from Corsair that could in a black and white box. Corsair, the makers of RAM and liquid coolers, cases and power supplies, and yes, SSDs. This is a 240 gigabyte SSD that I purchased for $80 back on January 25th, 2017. This drive was not very good. It had a good controller. I'm going to pronounce it Fison? Fison. P-H-I-S-O-N. Fison? Fison. I don't know. I can't pronounce anything. So it had a Fison controller, eight uh, man channels. It, it supposedly should have been good. But it had 40,000 random write IOPS in this size. It got better at the larger sizes, but at this size, it was like 10% of the performance of drives that came out one year later, or the nice Samsung 860 Evos, NVMe drives, etc. The, the performance of this was terrible. 60 terabytes total write life rating. I talked to you before about drives that had 200 or 400 or 600, or the modern drives that are into the petabytes of rating. 60, six, zero. Yeah. Now, in fairness, I'm sure if I still had this drive, then it probably would still work fine because it's too slow to actually write that much to. I don't believe I have this drive anymore. I think it was in a computer that I sold at some point. Uh, I didn't have any particular reason to keep track. I wish I could tell you where it went, but off it went. I can't even tell you what this was in. And that's interesting. That's how unremarkable and uninteresting. What computer? I'll bet one of you out there remembers. This was on the channel at some point. This was in a build. This was in like a Ryzen 5 1600 build or Ryzen 5. January 2017. This probably went in like a Ryzen 5 1600 build. I'll bet one of you leave a comment down below. Where did this go? I, I will read the comments. I'm curious where this ended up. Next, we have a PNY drive that has a very similar, if not possibly the same, Fison S10 controller that the Corsair drive had, but this one is a 480 gigabyte drive. And I bought this in 2016, May 11, 2016 to be specific, and I paid $110. Now here's what's interesting. I bought the Corsair drive for $80 in 2017 for 240 gigs. This, was not double the price a year earlier. If memory serves, their SSDs go up and down in price. Over time, they go down, but they occasionally pop in price. There have been a couple of periods during the history of our YouTube channel where SSDs actually got more expensive for a while, and you wish you had bought them back when they were cheap. They eventually got cheaper and then got really cheap. But right now, we're enjoying the benefits of cheap drives. You can buy a nice one terabyte NVMe SSD for 100 bucks a two terabyte drive for 200 bucks. You can buy a two terabyte SATA SSD. We will get to them for 90 something. In fact, I think those are down to like $87. I'll look them up in a minute. Under $100 for a two terabyte drive. Mark my words, a year from now, it is entirely possible that two terabyte drives will be back up to $150. They might not. They might keep going down. I hope they keep going down, but it has happened before. So I paid $110 for this in 2016. Not a clue where it went. I remember using it. I remember having it. I think I actually moved this between more than one machine. At 480 gigabytes six years ago, six and a half years ago at this point, that was a pretty decent size. Compare that to the over $300 that I paid for the Samsung 950 Pro NVMe drive that went into my $4,000 ultimate build, the i uh, the i7-6800K, at $110, that's pretty reasonable. Slow as dog meat compared to the 950 Pro, but 
you get what you pay for. Hang on, don't tell anybody this secret, but <clears throat> you get what you pay for. So this got put in a machine that got sold. I am 99% sure I do not have this drive. All drives less than a terabyte, and frankly, at this point, most terabyte drives are all being gotten rid of. So just like the Corsair, leave a comment down in the comment section below if you saw where this got built. Find the video on my channel where this got built. Because if you can find it, I'll put a heart next to your name and I will reply to your comment and I will say you get two more gold stars. Circling around back to ADATA, this is the SX6000 Pro. That sounds fancy. It must be a fast drive. NVMe, TLC. Not really a DRAM buffer. This uses the host memory buffer. This uses 64 megabytes of your system memory to basically keep track of what it's doing, and that's not enough on a 256 gig drive. Well, granted, the 500, uh, the 256 megabyte buffer uh, that is actually on the Intel 660P isn't really ideal either, but at least that's dedicated DRAM on the controller, whereas this has to use main system RAM and it uses a tiny amount. Fun fact, the Intel 660P drives, when they're direct writing to their QLC, are faster than this thing is direct writing to its TLC. I like a data, usually, sort of. I liked them more back then. The more I used their products and the more I got to know them, the less I liked them. This drive was pretty trash. I actually still have this drive. It is sitting on the shelf. I kept it beyond its sellability date. Uh, what is a 256 gig NVMe drive worth in 2022? Nothing. So it'll forever sit on the shelf and be part of the computer museum, but I would never ever put that into a machine because it is uh I don't want to say it's trash but man oh man oh man it's not good. Ewin Racing has a wide selection of chairs to fit all shapes and sizes of gamers ranging from petite to cuddly they have something for every type of gamer. Not just sizes but colors and material options as well including red, blue, purple, pink, orange and more plus cloth and leather choices. We have over half a dozen chair and desk videos in a playlist down in the video description below. We also have a very special offer just for Tech Deals viewers. Save 30% off of everything using discount code Tech Deals using our link in the video description. We have used Ewin gaming chairs for three years in our office, sitting on them for up to eight hour marathon live streams. They are very comfortable and we are happy to work with Ewin to bring you this special discount and recommend Ewin for all of your gaming chair and desk needs. The best laid plans of mice and men. When I originally started filming this video, my goal was thinking, well, I have all these SSDs on the desk. I just finished filming part two, the detailed Y vlog of the i5-13600K build. I could do a quick rundown and history of the SSDs, at least as far as the history of the channel goes. I'll go through the boxes, I'll talk about what everything is. Easy peasy, no big deal. The first part that you've just watched was an hour and a half of raw recording. It'll be edited down obviously to less than that, whatever you're watching now. I then realized part two should probably be filmed separately because it was gonna end up being entirely too long of a video and videos that long on YouTube do not do very well. That however, turned into part three because what you see on the desk is what was left over after I finished filming part two. Now this piece of footage is being recorded after I fil finished filming part two, but before I film part three. But you're watching it at the end of part one. Yeah, I know that's kind of confusing. The reason I'm recording this is I never originally recorded an ending to part one. That was two and a half weeks ago, which is why the desk looks different and I look different, but it is what it is. There will be linked down in the video description below links to part two and part three of this video series. I'm pretty sure I can finish that up in part three, I hope. Part two and three will be released over time. If you would like to see them early and you'd like to support our work, you can hit the join button for $2 a month or $20 for the entire year. You can join us as a silver member and get early access to videos. You can join us as a gold member and get access to over 100 member exclusive only videos. All kinds of things, including build videos, background videos, fun videos. 
You can see the thumbnails and titles of them, but obviously you cannot watch the videos themselves unless you are a gold member. Silver members get early access to videos. Gold members get early access to videos and over 100 member exclusive videos, and it's a great way to support your favorite content creator, which hopefully, if you've watched this far into this video, we are one of. In any case, thank you so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, and do all the YouTube stuff, and I will see all of you in part two and three of this video.